Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Today, Yapa Boss speaks on how to solve a 112-bit ECDLP using game consoles. And in this presentation, he will outline two projects which I, which he has been working on <laughs> during his PhD. Both projects are related to the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem, ECDLP, the theoretical foundations of many modern crypto systems. First he will outline how we have set a new record by solving the ECDLP over 112-bit prime field using a cluster of PlayStation 3 game consoles in 2009. Next, the negation map optimization is discussed. This is a technique to speed up the Pollard row method when solving the ECDLV. It is well known that the random walks used by Pollard row when combined with the negation map get trapped in fruitless cycles. He will present that previously published approaches to deal with this problem are plagued by recurring cycles and effective alternative countermeasures are proposed. So our speaker. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. So indeed, so Peter summed it right up. Um, so I'm Joppa Bos, to quickly re-app. I'm doing my PhD at the Laboratory for Cryptologic Algorithms in, at EPFL in Switzerland. And currently, I'm doing my internship here under supervision of Peter. And I want to talk about two projects I did during my PhD. So the first one is related to the title of the presentation, how to solve uh, elliptic curve discrete log problem with game consoles. And the second one is uh, related to the discrete log problem and it will discuss the negation map optimization. So when you talk about game consoles, it gives you a good opportunity to show all fancy pictures. So the picture here, unfortunately, is not our cluster. It's part of currently the biggest PlayStation cluster in the world, and it's located here in the US. It's from the Air Force. They have uh, even a much bigger cluster. I, I think it's one and a half thousand PlayStations they have. And they, they simply also use it because they're cheap and because they are computationally really efficient. Um, so first I will give a quick and a few slides, a summary of the cell broadband engine. Yes. I'm not sure, I think they use it for rendering, oh yeah, processing their data. I'm not 100% sure what they use it actually for. So first I will give a summary of the cell broadband engine architecture, which is the uh, chip which is inside the PlayStation. So this actually sums it up real nicely. So to give, I will go into the details which we actually need later a little bit more. So on top, you see eight SPUs, uh, SPEs, the synergistic processing elements. So these are like compute cores, and these are the cores which we are interested in. And I will go into more detail what these things are. They are all connected together using a circular bus, so they can all communicate with each other. And this bus is also connected to the PPE, which is also a processor. So there's an additional processor, and we won't be using it which is uh, a derivative of the PowerPC architecture. But our main focus will be on these eight tiny cores up here. 
So why are we interested in the PlayStation? So it's all about price performance ratio. So on the old PlayStation, that's this a little bit fatter guy here, um, it's now discontinued. There are six of these SPEs available. So the chip actually has eight of them. One is <coughs> disabled on the chip because while manufacturing them, if one of them fails, they don't have to throw away the chip and they can still sell it. And one of them is reserved by the hypervisor uh, hardware layer from Sony. So there are six available on the PlayStations. And you used to be able, or Sony let you, install your own operating system on it. So you could simply install your operating system, write your code, and run your own code. Note that they didn't allow you to have access to the graphics cards, because otherwise you could obviously install your games under Linux and you don't buy their games anymore. So you only get access to this chip, not the graphics card. On the newer model, that's this tiny model here, they, di they simply don't allow you, so after this, there is a bit of a history, I won't go into the details, the, this whole architect architecture got hacked, and now they don't allow you to install Linux anymore. Yes? Is the chip 280 watt or the, or the entire board including the memory, it's an awful lot for one chip. It's not the chip, it's the whole PlayStation, so including the graphics card, which consumes okay. most of the power. But this chip was put in other devices as well. For instance, it was put in a PCI Express board or for compute clusters in a Blade server. Now look at the price difference. So here there are two cell chips in one Blade server. Note they have much more memory. You can, it's just a regular PC, so you can plug in up to 32 gigs of memory while PlayStation is restricted to roughly 256 megabytes. So if you have a high memory demanding applications, the PlayStation, you, you simply cannot use it. But look at the price. So I checked this morning, actually the price dropped even a little bit more. It's not $300, it's now around 250. And then you have a PlayStation. Well, if you want to buy this Blade server, you're looking about a 10 to 15, 14K investment. So that's the motivation why Originally, we purchased these PlayStations. Why is that? Why is that? Why there is such a big difference? So there are multiple reasons why there is this big difference. So first of all, they sell the PlayStations with loss. I mean, that's how it goes in the whole game console land. You sell your console with loss and you make all your profit on your games. So, uh, because if you make your console too high, no one will buy it and no one will buy your games. So that's one of the main reasons why these things are so cheap now. So if we go, yes? So you said that they used to allow you to actually run whatever OS you want. Right? Yeah. So presumably that was for people like you who wanted to use it for other Yes, it was, so I'm not 100% sure why they did it, but I know indeed a lot of universities from all different fields uh, were really happy to use this. So, Yes. The yes, that's true. So I don't know what their initial initial incentive was to allow you to install your own operating system. We were at least very happy that we were able to. So to zoom in a little bit more on the cores that uh, which are our main target, the synergistic processing elements. So they consist of three parts: the synergistic processing unit. So, which is the compute core, this had access to a large register file. So it has 128 registers. Note that this is much, much bigger than, for instance, your typical x86 or x86-64 architecture. And they're much wider. They're 128 bits, so they're comparable to the 128-bit registers you have in your SSE or MMX extension units in regular architecture. It's a single instruction, multiple data architecture, and it has a dual pipeline. Now this is important, so what does it mean? It has a dual pipeline. It means that every clock cycle, you can dispatch two instructions, one, in the, one even instruction and one odd instruction. They go both in one pipeline. So it's a challenge for the programmer to redesign your algorithm in such a way that you always fill both pipelines to really get, to really dispatch two different instructions every clock cycle. It has a local store, which you can, it's not really a cache, but you can compare it with some sort of a cache. It's 256 kilobytes, and your executable 
and all the data required by your program locally needs to fit in here. So it's almost nothing. If it doesn't, it not necessarily needs to fit in here, but otherwise you have to go to the memory flow controller and you have to manually fetch all your memory from memory. So it's not like on a regular PC, it will all be done automatically for you. You have to really handle all the pointer magic yourself and you have to make sure that the memory flow controller really fetches the memory for you. We are always, uh, in this project, concerned in this case. Everything fits in our 256 kilobyte. So the registers, it's single instruction, multiple data. So you, on multiple levels, so you can think of it on the byte, half word, or word level. You can even think of it at the bit level, that it's a 128-way SIMD level on all the bits. So the preferred slot on the cell architecture is on the word level. So we will do four-way SIMD. So we will process on four 32-bit words in parallel. So Yes. Uh, just a side note, uh, the local jargon, 16-bit uh, is a word and 32-bit is a double word because of what the old Intel word was like. It depends yeah. entirely how you define the words. Jargon. So I will in this presentation, and yeah. this is also how, how uh, in this architecture, a word is defined as 32-bit. Yeah. So another feature of this architecture is that it has a really rich instruction set. So, for instance, all the two input, one output binary functions are available. So this is already a feature which is not available in the x86 architecture. Furthermore, it has this whole scala of different instructions for which the shuffle bytes is a really interesting instruction which is also available in the SSE extensions. But since we will be mainly interested in doing fast arithmetic, let's have a look at the multiplication instructions. So, unfortunately, it only has a 16-bit multiplier. So it can multiply 16 bits to 32 bits. The upside is, at the same cost, it has a multiply and add instruction. So it, it, at the same latency, you can add a 32-bit word to this result, and it won't cost you anything extra. The other upside is, we don't do one, but we do four of them, because it's a single instruction, multiple data. We do four of these operations every uh, clock cycle. So this is roughly the setting. So taking all this into consideration, the programmer has to obey, or not has to obey, but better take these things into account. One of the things I didn't mention is branching. So as on all parallel architectures, and especially on single instruction multiple data architectures, branching is best to be avoided if possible. And on this architecture, there is no hardware branch prediction. So everything is done in software, so there is nothing smart out there. So if you mispredict the branch, you get a huge penalty. Instead, there is a prepare to branch instruction to redirect the instruction prefetch to the branch targets. Furthermore, you should really take into consideration your memory limitations. As I said, the executable and all the data should fit in your local store. Otherwise, you have to fetch everything yourself from main memory, which of course comes at a performance cost. For us, the main instruction set limitation is the 16-bit multiplier. And you have to re redesign and rethink a bit how you fill both of these pipelines. So what is our setting? What hardware do we have to run everything on? So at LACAL, our lab in Switzerland, we physically have in our cluster room 190 PlayStation 3 sitting. Then we have a room, this is a picture of that room, which is called Play Lab, where we invite little children to come to the university so we can bore them first with a presentation about crypto, and then they can play games. And you can see they can sit around the table. They, they, so here they have monitors. In the cluster room, of course, they're not connect, connected to any monitors, and there are no game consoles. Um, there are four PlayStations per table, and we have six tables. And then we have five PlayStations scattered around our offices to debug our code. So in total, we have 219 PlayStation 3s. And to show you another nice picture, this is how our PlayStation cluster looks like. So you see it has a whole bunch of shelves. And on each one of these subshells, there are four PlayStations located. And not directly, but they're in, in this zigzag motion because the heat is dispensed, dispensed from this side so that the heat doesn't blow directly in the face of the one in the back, otherwise it will get immediately overheated. 
So now we know a little bit more about the chip inside a PlayStation. So many people found other uses than gaming. Some Japanese people even rebuilt a PlayStation such that they could barbecue on it. Um, and I don't know what kind of sausages these are. They lo don't look very tasty, but it's probably some kind of Japanese sausage. Um, but we're actually going to, going to do something else. We're going to try to see how we can solve the 112-bit uh, elliptic curve discrete log problem. So this was joint work with Marcelo Cajara, Torsten Kleinjung, Arjen Lenstra, and Peter. So what is our setting? So we're given an elliptic curve E over a finite field Fp, where P is an odd prime. We're given a point on this elliptic curve, and for now we will assume it has prime order n because we're doing crypto. And we're given another point Q, and we're told it's a multiple of this point P. And given all this, the question is, what is k? Find the integer k. So there's a, a list of challenges published by Certicom, similar to the RSA challenge list. And um, it allows it challenges you to solve challenges over prime fields and over binary extension fields. So the previous largest solved challenge was over 109-bit prime challenge solved by Chris Monaco using a Boink project in November 2002. And in total, he estimated it would have taken four to 5,000 PCs working day and night for one year. The next challenge on that list is a 131-bit prime field challenge. So we were looking into this and we said, OK, at this takes at least 2,000 times more effort. So maybe this is a bit too hard for to, to at least to do on our PlayStation cluster. So then we looked at the current standards. So we simply looked at three, uh, the three big elliptic curve standards, standards for efficient cryptography, the wireless transport layer security specification, and the digital signature standard. So what immediately jumps out are these really low key sizes, 112-bit, which are used in these two standards. So they're used for smart card security and these things, so for a low-level type of security. So for us, it was not a question, can we solve this? But the question was, how fast can we solve this 112-bit uh, elliptic curve discrete log problem? So how are you going to approach? So the, the typical approach is you use polar draw. If you have generic curves, the, f the fastest algorithm out there to solve this is the polar draw algorithm. So the underlying idea is that you're going to look for pairs, C and D, such that this equation holds. This is called a collision. Because if you find a pair like this, where the CI and the CJs are different and the DI and the DJs are different, then you can find, because you know Q is, is equal to K times P, you can find your K by simply computing this. So how are we going to look for these collisions? So the idea is to perform a random walk through the set of points generated by P. How are we going to do this? So we have, we have our points P and Q, and our walk is on points xi, which are known multiples of the sum of the P and the Qs, with the help of some iteration function. And we know, since we do a random walk in a finite set, this will eventually collide. And based on the birthday paradox, you can show that the expected number of steps needed to collide again is roughly square root of the order the group we're looking at. So how are we going to achieve this? So first of all, we're going to represent, we're going to really exploit the SIMD characteristics of this architecture. So what we're going to do, so here we have a 128-bit vector. So these are 32-bit words, four of them. And if we represent a number, we have an array or a whole bunch of these 128-bit vectors, uh, 120, yeah, 128-bit vectors. And each vector will contain four uh, different 32-bit parts of different numbers. So we are going to represent the numbers like this. So we have a number x1, which goes up like this. x2 goes up like this. So we do it column-wise. We represent our numbers. So in this way, if we add different parts, we add actually on four, different, on four limbs of different numbers. So some more implementation details, and I won't go into the details of these, but they are described in the paper. 
we're going to optimize for high throughput. We don't care if we have to wait a little bit longer if we get higher throughput. And we're going to interleave to hide the instruction latencies two of these four-way single instruction multiple data streams. Furthermore, we present, because occasionally we need to compute an inversion, and inversions are relatively to the multiplication, quite expensive, we uh, propose an efficient four-way SIMD modeler inversion algorithm. And using all this, we're going to compute 400 curves on one of these SPEs in parallel. So why don't we simply compute on one curve? Why do we choose 400 curves? This is beca because of a method by Peter Montgomery called the simultaneous inversion method that you, if you have independent inversions, you can trade one inversion for roughly three multiplications. So in practice, that is a really, really good trade-off. And the number 400 is because this is exactly the number for which we completely <coughs> fill the whole local store of the SPE. 400 curves is the max uh, we found which fit in the 256 kilobyte. And we do not use the negation map optimization. I will not go into details. This will be the, the second part of the presentation. I will go into a little bit detail here. To achieve more speed, we're going to trade correctness for efficiency. So, as you might know, adding points on, on an elliptic curve, so you have point addition and you have point duplication. Point duplication is used if your uh, inputs are the same, so you do x plus x. So there are different formulas. If you feed x and x in your addition formula, you get a wrong result. And we are not going to check for this. For two reasons, it saves us code space, which we can use to run more curves uh, to fit in the local store. And it costs us a branch. We don't have to check if this actually happens, and branching was expensive. So it might happen, but this is with an extremely low probability that something goes wrong. And if it goes wrong, one of our 400 walks is wrong, and we simply restart it. So we truly don't care. Another trick, uh, which I will explain in the next slide, is that uh, we designed faster modular reduction, but it might compute the wrong result. Yes? Yes, so occasionally the algorithm, how it works, it, it will walk to, to, to the set, and occasionally when it finds a point with special properties, it will output it to a central server, and there we can do some post-sanity checking. And there we can see if, if, if something went wrong or not. So before describing how we do this faster multiplication, let's have a look at the prime which is proposed in the standard. So it's a 112-bit prime, and it's this number. So you immediately see this is not a randomly picked prime, it has some very special shape. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate a modulo redundant representation, a modulo p twiddle, and we're going to use a redundant representation. So let's take r as 2 to the 128, then we're going to do multiplication mod p twiddle, where p twiddle is simply r minus 3. So it's a multiple of the prime. Note immediately that we have x times r is congruent to 3x mod p twiddle. So how are we going to exploit this special shape? So let's define a reduction map R, then which is defined like this. And we can immediately see that if we write our number X in a radix 2 to the 128 system, and we, do, we take the lower part and we add 3 times the higher part, then it's congruent mod P twiddle. So this is a basic trick also used for the NIST primes. But how are we going to uh, use this and how do we get wrong results? This is because we only want to apply it twice. If we apply it three times, we always get correct results. They're always fully reduced and everything is nice. We're going to apply it twice. So how many times will it happen that we get an incorrect result? So let me first give a sketch, uh, just a back on the envelope calculation, how one can do this. So we're, as input, we get a number, which is between 0 and r squared, because it's after a multiplication step, and we want to reduce the number. And it's written, x0 is the low part, and x1 is the high part of a radix 2 to the 128 system. We apply our map, map r, and we get a number y. You immediately can see that the high part is less than or equal than 3. So this number is indeed too big, and we cannot use it for the rest of our computations. So now let's split this into two cases, y1 is 3 and y1 is less than or equal than 2. And then we can see that if we apply the map twice with straightforward uh, computation, that the max value it can obtain is r plus 5, which is indeed too big. So we need to apply it a third time. But how often does this go wrong? 
So the numbers R till R plus 5 are wrong, so that are 6 out of the R plus 6 possible ways. So a very rough heuristic approximation is this. And remember, R is 2 to the 128. So it doesn't happen very often. So if you do this a little bit more carefully, a little bit more sophisticated, you can actually show using some heuristics that this uh, is the probability that things will go wrong and this actually is less than 1 over R. So less than 1 over 2 to the 128 times it will go wrong and since we expect to do less than 2 to the 128 reductions we expect that it will never go wrong and actually we, s we use this and we didn't see a single time where it went wrong in practice. So to give you some performance results, so we implemented all this. So you can see here the modular multiplica multiplication using sloppy reduction takes 430 cycles. Um, and most of the time indeed is spent by the multiplication and not by the reduction. So you see some other numbers, so for the inversion for instance, indeed it takes a really long time, but we only need to do one. One inversion is shared among all the 400 uh, curves in parallel, so in total we only pay roughly 12 cycles for it. So in total, to, do, to take one step in this huge group, to do one iteration, takes roughly 456 cycles. So we have our PlayStation cluster. That means that we per second we actually compute 2 to the 33 iterations per second on our cluster, and we work on more than half a million elliptic curves in parallel. So that was always really nice to tell visitors when they walked into the cluster room, did you know that you're now in a room where more than half a million curves are being processed at this very moment? Um, so as you asked, we occasionally need to output a distinguished point, point with a special property. We used very naive methods to store these. We do didn't use any fancy techniques because it was not necessary. We, we stored them naively using 4 times 16 bytes. Every two seconds there would come a distinguished point and we expected, based on the birthday paradox, that we need 300 gigs of storage, which is nothing. So I now presented you all these numbers and I claim that it is fast, but how do you know that this is actually a good result? So let's try and compare it with some other results out there. So there is this FPGA machine called the Cobacobana, um, which is work by Ganesh, Upar and Peltz, and there is a paper describing the same algorithm, the parallelized polar row algorithm, aimed for different bit sizes. And we will, of course, be interested in the 96 and 128 bit sizes. Note that the main difference is they target generic primes, so they can't use this fast arithmetic, while we use, 100, we use a 112 bit prime, although we do everything mo modulo p twiddle, which is 128 bit, but we have this fast reduction. So to buy the Scobo Cubana you need around 10k US dollars and assuming that the Playstations are not at discount so we really need to pay $300, we can buy roughly 33 Playstations for this price. So as you could see here the paper proposing the Scobo Cubana and the Spolar Rose from 2008. So let's give them a doubling factor by Moore's law that everything went faster. So these are their performance numbers, they can do this many iterations per second. Let's give them a factor of two speed up due to Moore's law. And let's assume, so the negation map optimization, it's an optimization which leads in a 1.4 roughly times speed up. We didn't use it, but let's assume they could get it to work and everything worked fine. So we give them that as well. Then these are the final performance numbers and we can see for 33 playstations that we are at least a magnitude faster than this FPGA hardware machine. But, there are, are actually two buts, we didn't use, we still have this PowerPC core on the PlayStation, which actually didn't compute anything. So we could have sped up our calculation using this PowerPC core. And on the other hand, there is now a new Cobo Cubana out there, which much, much faster FPGAs, but there are no performance results known yet how fast these algorithms would actually run on this newer Cobo Cubana because it's out this year, it's really new. So what was our challenge? Because there was no challenge specified. So this is actually a bit of the boring part, the solution, no one really cares what the solution is, but I will present it pretty quickly. So the point P is the generator proposed 
in the standard. And to come up with a challenge, we had to make sure that people believed us that we made a challenge which was not pre-cooked, of course. So we simply chose the decimal expansion of pi as the x coordinate of our point q. And then the expected number of iterations is around 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17. And we ran this between January and July in 2009, but not continuously because once in a while these kits came, then we had to run demos in our cluster. We had other projects. Um, but in total, using the latest version of our code, this could have done, be done in three and a half months. So these are the points P and Q, and this is the, the N, the prime order of the, of the group. And then we found, after uh, so in July 2009, this solution, which indeed by itself is not interesting at all. So now let's go to the second part of this. Yes? Is that the uh, raw method a little faster? How does it compare with the lambda method? So, OK. So there are, there's a bit of a confusion always in the literature what actually the lambda method is, because there are two algorithms which are known as the pollard lambda method. So you, some people say the pollard lambda method, it's the parallelized version of pollard row, because it, it, if you visualize it, it has a lambda shape. So then the answer is we use the pollard lambda method. And then there's this other pollard lambda method with the kangaroos, and that asymptotically has the same runtime is this, but in practice it's a little bit slower because you need to know some other things as well. You need to know, you, you need to know some other things about your group as well. It is faster if you know it, that your uh, solution lies in a certain interval. Then the, the kangaroo method is faster in practice. So now let's move to our, uh, the second project, which is about the negation map, which is a joint work with uh, Torsten Kleinjung and Arjen Lenstra and was published at ANTS last year. So what, so this actually was a result of the first part, what I presented. Um, we wanted to study the negation map in practice. So first of all, why? Uh, we focus on prime fields. So why do we focus on prime fields? If you, for instance, look at the uh, Sweet Bay cryptography set by the NSA, they only allow you to do elliptic curves for prime fields. They, they don't allow you to do uh, elliptic curves over binary extension fields. And of course, the whole thing why we study this, if you can solve the discrete log problem fast, you can break elliptic curve based schemes. So now look at all the, the previous prime field records over 79, 89, 97, and 109 bits, and the one I just described about 112 bits. Um, so they were all solved. But there is this textbook optimization. It's in every crypto book they say there is this negation map. And it will lead, no matter what curve you have, to a square root of two speed up. So 1.4 times speed up. That's really nice. But actually, it's not being used in any of these records. So why did people not use this optimization? So while trying to use this for our setting, we discovered a lot of side issues with this, and that this paper is, well, is the result of that. So let's first zoom in a little bit more on Pollard Row. So I said we're going to do a random walk in our groups generated by our given point P. But we cannot do a truly random walk, because that would be tremendously slow, and we need to keep track of the multiples of the points P and Q we're having. So in practice, what, what people are doing, you're going to approximate a random walk. So this is done with some index function, which in the rest of this presentation I will call L. So your, groups, your group generated by the point P is partitioned into T sets, T partitions, and um, this function L will map a point to simply an integer bet uh, between 0 and T. And we assume, and in practice that is more or less always the case, that the size of these partitions is roughly the same. So they, are more, they, they all have the same cardinality. And so what people do in practice, we compute these t pre-computed constants. And you can either use an r adding walk, which is simply your next point is your current point plus the, uh, one of your pre-computed points based on which part partition it falls in. Or you say our next point is this case. Or if the partition is bigger, we simply double the point. So that is how you simulate 
a random walk. That is what people do in practice to simulate a random walk. And Tesca actually showed in 2001, if you take R around 20, so if you have around 20 partitions, or more than 20, then the performance of this not so random walk is actually close to a real random walk. Yes? If you apply R plus S, then it looks like the probability of doubling is much bigger than you would. You should really do doubling correctly, or I'm, I'm, I'm missing something. Sorry? If you said before that you will crash in the case of doubling. So it never happens. Ah, now but here, doubling doesn't yes. happen with final probability. Here it happens a lot, but this, so, uh, this is a completely different project. So here we do adding, and here we do doubling. So that was just an implementation issue to speed things up. And here, this is just, we're looking now from things from a theoretical point of view. So we assume we can add, we can double, and things will go correctly. So what is the negation map? So it was introduced in 98, and by Wiener and uh, Zucerato, I probably don't pronounce it correctly. And the idea is to define an equivalence relation on your group by associating P and minus P to each other, and then instead of solving your discrete log on your whole group, you do it modulo your equivalence relations. And this is size n, and this is size n over two. So in practice, this has the huge advantage that uh, you get a speed up of a, squector, a factor squared of two. And the only thing you need to do is that given a point P, you need to be able to compute really fast the point minus P and vice versa. And for elliptic curves, this is the case. If you have a point, then the negative of this point is by simply taking the negative of your y-coordinate if you're using uh, Weierstrass coordinates. So in practice, how would your iteration function look? So we are at some point PI, we look up, we compute to which partition it belongs, we select the, the correct partition constant, we add it, uh, we add the two, and we add, and we compute the negative of this point. Then we look, we have to set some property which is the representative of this equivalence class, and you can for instance take, if you normalize the y-coordinate, so you, um, the one with the lowest or the highest value. It doesn't matter, you need to have a deterministic way of selecting a representative of this equivalence class. Let's assume that in this case it's the minus point and then we take this as our next point in our walk. So that is the ID, how the negation map, uh, how you would alter your iteration function. But that something which is already well known, if you simply apply it as described here, you will not, find, you will not solve any discrete logs at all. This is due to something which is called fruitless cycles. So the most simple fruitless cycle is, a, uh, is one of length two, um, discussed also by Dursma, Gaudry, and Morin in 99, is if you have your point P, and it belongs with probability one to some partition, let's say I, and with, so you compute it, and let's say the representative here is the minus one, so that happens with probability half. So then we're, at this point, and then we're gonna, and then let's say this point also belongs to partition i. So that happens since there are partitions. We're assuming we're using an r-adding walk. It happens with prob with probability one over r, and then with probability one, the representative will be the minus point again, and then we're back at our point p. So, and we will simply, when we implement this or when we run this, it will simply go and go and go, and we're stuck in this fruitless cycle, and we don't get anywhere. And it happens with probability one over two r. So one way of reducing this event uh, introduced in 98 was by more or less detecting this situation. So that's what they're going to do here. So they're going to look for a partition number which is minimal such that these two are not the same. That's actually what this formula is saying. So if they're not the same, you simply take this partition. If the partition numbers of these two points are the same, then you try to look for one, uh, you increase the partition number and hope that the resulting point is not the same. Of course, you pay a price for this because it might happen that you calculate the next point and uh, like here, belongs to I and you have to redo it. So the cost increase with at least a factor one plus one over R. And in some cases, it might happen that all your points will add to, to something bad and then you simply restart the walk. But that is very, very unlikely. 
uh, with probability r to the r. Oh, once every r to the r steps. So this was only for two cycles. Of course, cycles of any length can, can occur. So a general technique described by Galland, uh, Lambert, and Vanstone in 2000 uh, have an elegant method. They simply say, we run for some alpha steps. We simply iterate and iterate and iterate. Alpha is usually much bigger than beta. And then we record the next beta step. So we simply store them uh, in, in memory. Then we take the next point P and we compare it to the previous <coughs> beta points. If it's the same to any of the beta points, we know we're stuck in a cycle. If it's not, we know for sure that not uh, a cycle of length up to beta is present. So this gives you a technique to detect cycles, but how to get out of this cycle. So cycle escaping can be done, of course, in numerous ways. So uh, proposed was to add one of your other, so you have to deterministically select one of your points, which is your representative of this cycle, and then you need to add something else to it. So you can add one of your other partition constants to it. You can simply add a pre-computed value f prime to it or from a list of pre-computed values to it. And then you're not stuck in the cycle anymore because you add a different constant to this current point. So this was all known. This was all already known in literature. And it was, as far as I know, pretty much assumed that this would solve all issues. But in practice, when we implemented it, I saw, for instance, that this happened pretty frequently. So this is when using this technique to reduce the occurrence of two cycles, but still two cycles can occur. So this is an example. So let's say we're at a point P, we walk to the next point, and this point belongs to partition I minus one. So everything is fine, they're not the same. So we go there. When we're here, <coughs> we go to a next point which belongs to partition i minus 1. It's not good, we add 1 to it, but hey, we cancel the previous step. So, of course this happens, the probability that it, this happens is not 1 over 2r anymore, it's a bit lower, so lower bound is 1 over 2r cubed. But still, it will happen in practice, and you need to have some way of detecting this, otherwise all your walks eventually get stuck in some infinite loop. An, offic an officially extension to this two-cycle reduction technique is to uh, reduce the event of four cycles. So a four-cycle similar to the two-cycle technique looks like this, and entering one happens with this probability. And you can, it's a bit more, it's a little bit more tricky to define your iteration function because your iteration function needs to be deterministic uh, for every point where you start because you have this, you collapse points with this negation map and you need to make sure that you're, you're always on the same walk, otherwise you won't find anything. Um, but the idea is exactly the same, so you now don't look ahead one point, but you look ahead one point and two points, and you hope to reduce uh, the events of four cycles. So the disadvantage here is that you, have you might have to redo two steps, so your iteration function becomes a little bit more ex expensive. But the funny thing is there is a positive effect to it, because now your walk get some sort of a different shape because you don't allow certain walks in your walk and uh, certain you don't allow certain patterns in your iteration function so for our function g this image of g is the all these points are a subset of our whole group with the size of this image roughly r minus 1 over r times all the points in our group so we get a, a positive effect of the square root of r minus 1 over r but in ex as exactly the same situation as before, that we could have two cycles with a two-cycle reduction. So the nice thing to know with four-cycle reduction, this actually is prevented because it looks two ahead and it will note, hey, we do an I here and two steps ahead, we will do an I again. So it's prevented. But with four-cycle reduction, of course, we can have two cycles as well. The, the, the dotted lines, the lines which are taken and then cancelled, are only a bit longer and it will it will happen the probability is only slightly higher and of course that we can have two cycles with two cycle reduction we can have four cycles with four cycle reduction as, as well and you think you might think I'm completely crazy but these things we observe them many many times in practice so these things really really happen 
So here you can see, so all the sides are taken and cancelled and all the conditions are exactly right that all these points cancel each other out. So we saw that all these probabilities strongly depend on R. So you could say, why are we not simply increasing this R to some high value? Things become really, really unlikely and problem solved. In theory, yes, that's completely true. In practice, it's not that simple. In practice, so here, for instance, a plot on a, on a regular PC. So here we have the size of R, so the, the log of R, so the R n walk, the number of partitions we need to store. And here we have the performance of our iteration function. Yes? So this step is about R equals 1,000, means the probability is something like 1 in a billion. Yes. Is that, that's too high for you? Uh, yes, because you want to calculate a lot of steps. Okay. As, as we will see, we will calculate many million steps, even on one processor or core or I don't know where your computer on per second and you will need to run this for years so mm -hmm. even if the probability that happens is a few billion you run into it within a minute so it's uh, so here you see that in practice when you increase the size of R it here stays more or less for a while doesn't decrease too much but here you see a significant drop which can easily be explained that the whole partition table doesn't fit anymore into your cache so you have constant cache misses it needs to be retrieved from memory and your iteration function in practice will drop from uh, four and a half million to roughly half a million steps per second. So this, and plus the fact that you don't have eliminated the occurrence of fruitless cycles. They are much more rare, but they will still happen. So I discussed all this. So now when you've seen this, you're, you're being smart. You say, okay, let's use all this. We're going to use an R-ending walk with an R which is not too small, it's not too big. We're going to use two or four cycle reduction techniques. And we use this method where we Skype uh, cycles with, uh, we go for alpha and then we record beta steps. I claim many walks will never find, uh, never find a single distinguished point. That depends on your point property, but your discrete log will not be solved. So this is due to something called recurring cycles. So let's have a look at this funny picture. So let's assume we're stuck in this four cycle. After a while this is detected. So this can be any bigger cycle as well, but for the sake of simplicity it's a four cycle. And let's say that P is our designated point to escape this cycle. So we add our a different partition constant to it, P plus FK. So we escape out of it, but it's very likely that we recur to the same cycle again and then again we're stuck in an infinite loop because after a while the cycle is detected and we say yay we're really happy we're going to escape the cycle but then within a few steps we're back into the cycle so again we haven't solved anything so to recap an overview of all the different uh, probabilities so we can see here the probability to enter a two and a four cycle in a regular way or when using the two or four cycle reduction techniques. So you can indeed see that the probabilities are significantly reduced. So it becomes less likely to enter such cycles. And here are the probabilities to recur to your same cycle after escaping. And here the price you pay for it. So the, the, the times your iteration function becomes more expensive. So how are we gonna fix this last issue? So heuristically, you can assume that a cycle with at least one duplication in it is not fruitless. So what do we mean by this? So let's go back to the begin of this presentation. We are actually looking for a cycle. The polar draw algorithm wants that you have a cycle because then you get this collision. And if you have a cycle, you can show if you have a cycle with at least one duplication in it, it's not fruitless. What does it mean it's not fruitless? Then you can solve your discrete log problem. So the idea is to reduce the number of fruitless cycles by either using a mixed walk or if you're stuck in the cycle by simply, by simply go to a designated point and double that point. Then the probability to go back to the same cycle is extremely low. So the advantage is you more or less avoid all recurring cycles. A disadvantage is duplications uh, when used with virus coordinates, as th that is what people would use in, with polar draw in practice, 
are slightly more expensive, so using this inversion trick, a du duplication will cost roughly seven multiplications, while an addition costs six multiplications. So you pay, and since multiplication is the main uh, uh, time-consuming part of polar row, this is a disadvantage, but you avoid a lot of trouble. So we run a lot of tests, and here I will explain this in more detail, some, some numbers to show, uh, to, to, to illustrate something. So what do these numbers actually mean? So F means two cycle reduction and G means four cycle reduction. E means that we're using uh, the regular cycle escaping and E bar means that we escape by using duplications. So on top here are the performance numbers when using the negation map. So let's first uh, describe what setting we're using. We're gonna run for two times 10 to the nine iterations. So on RPC, an AMD Phenom, which we tested on 10 to the nine iterations, took roughly half an hour to run. So that is a, so we run a considerable amount of iterations and then we're gonna run twice half an hour and we're gonna ignore the yield from the first half hour because we might find a lot there and then they might enter all these infinite loops and then it's not interesting because we care about the long-term yield. So we're gonna look, our long-term yield is this second 10 to the nine iterations. So the yield in millions is, are these numbers, the first numbers here. And the speed up, so we take this as a base, is uh, the speed up compared to not using the negation map, including some uh, theoretical measures. For instance, you can see here that actually when using a 32 adding walk, when not using the negation map, the performance is a little bit higher, 7.28 million, but we're using the RS64 because a, a 32 adding walk is slightly less random than a 64 adding walk. And if you take this theoretical measurement into account, you expect to find uh, your, you solve your discrete log a little bit faster with its R equals 64. So this will be our base, which we compare to. And so now let's look at some of the other cases. So for instance, if we just use the four cycle reduction technique without any <coughs> cycle escaping, it's not a surprise that when your R is really low in the second half hour, they're all stuck and we will not find anything. So it's, it's, you, you cannot expect to solve anything, a large ECDLP with it. Of course, when your R grows, it will still find something in the second half hour, but then you would expect a few hours later, these are all stuck as well. Um, so our, our best combination, so for these, we display some more numbers. So these top, Top numbers here are the number of additional additions. So these are the additions uh, spent, for instance, in a fruitless cycle, or spent when computing the next point and we had to redo it. So it are uh, elliptic curve point additions, which did not bring you any further. So they were uh, yeah, pointless, so to speak. And the number below there are the number of duplications used to escape. So for instance, here, we didn't use any duplications. This was a regular E, not an E bar, so these are always zero. But here we used an E bar, so you see we used some duplications and these were a little bit more expensive. So our best combination was using a two cycle reduction technique and detecting longer cycles and then escaping them by using duplication. For an R is 128, because if we went bigger, we get run into all these caching problems. And there we see that we get a speed up of a factor 1.29. So first, look at this 6.57. So our performance actually is a bit lower than when not, not using the negation map, which was 7.27. But since we get this square root of 2 speed up, the netto effect is 1.29. This number below here is taking only this additional additions and the extra cost of duplications into account, what theoretically we would expect the maximum achievable speed up. So without considering side effects from a cache or from branching. So not taking into account any practical considerations, just from these numbers, what is the max achievable speed up we can do? So there is still a gap between these two, um, but I will say something about that in the next slide. So using the negation map optimiz optimization for solving ECD LPs in practice, it actually is useful and you should use it. So we didn't use it for our PlayStation calculation, but uh, 
and there are some things to say there as well because it's a SIMD architecture which makes things even more complicated. But you should use it. Um, but you should make sure you use two and four cycle reduction techniques and you should make sure that recurring cycles are avoided by, for instance, escaping the cycle using duplications and using a medium-sized R-adding walk. So we managed to get a, a speed up of max 1.29, which is unfortunately a bit less than our square root of two, but so we stated in the paper that it might be simply due to our, uh, in, that we weren't capable of coming up with a better implementation or better techniques to do this. So we left it open to find maybe better cycle reduction or escaping techniques. And we challenged people to do better. And actually this year, a paper at PKC by Dan Bernstein, Tanya Lange and Peter Schwabe uh, presented a way, uh, a future work, a follow-up work, which indeed addressed two of these issues. So they, they targeted the PlayStation architecture as well. Um, and first of all, they presented a way to implement the negation map uh, with using straight line code, so without using any branches. So that was really nice. That already speed uh, things up. And then they presented some techniques to use a huge adding walk, a 2048 adding walk, so that already reduces the probability to enter cycles a lot. But so on a regular PC, it might be a little bit different because the cell, as, as we showed, it's cacheless. If it fits in your local store, everything is fast. There is no cache. Um, unfortunately, they didn't measure a direct comparison how fast their implementation was compared to a non-negation map setting. They only measured some functions in their code, so there was no direct real comparison. But they, they said, so we estimate that compared to a non-negation map setting, we achieve a 1.37 times speed up. And this is exactly in agreement with the theoretical numbers we've shown before. You yes. Adding, you make 2,000 steps of No, no, so 2,048 adding walk is means you, you partition your whole group in 2,048 partitions. Ah, okay. So, and then, so that are these numbers here. So these are, so here we use 16 partitions to 512 partitions, and they, uh, use the technique to, to, to store these partition numbers uh, uh, using less space so they could fit more partitions in memory and that would reduce the, the, the likelihood of running into these fruitless cycles. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Yes. One is um, by, by the, the numbers you gave, I, I would estimate that going up to about 128 bit prime is about a factor of a thousand more cost. But there would be a lot more cost going from 128 to 129. Um, just mm. the, the management. I'm yes. just wondering if you have yes. any so, estimate about so how this much pain, how yes. much cost there would be. This cost was a very, very, very rough and imprecise yes. estimate. It only took into account the, the, the bit complexity and indeed not the, the additional arithmetic complexity that you have to compute with slightly larger numbers. No, that's true. So that's an additional challenge even. Yeah. So I mean, maybe the, the other way of asking the question was, what if you were doing this in machines with 110 bit registers instead of 128 bit registers? <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, then we would have to come up with different arithmetic tricks and uh, <laughs> nice methods to, to, to run all this. No, it's true. So, so those, we, we... Factor of two or three, or order of magnitude, or do you have any idea? Ah, yeah, so it depends. If you're, it depends also which algorithms you're using. So we were using, because it were small, relatively small bit size numbers, we were using school book multiplication, for instance, for everything. So then, and since multiplication is your main runtime, so it, it would maybe depend on this algorithm, but if you go for much larger numbers, you could use Karatsuba, Tom Cook, or, but, or even FFTs, but these things are not faster for these small elliptic curve sized uh, uh, targets. The, yeah, so I think the, the 131 bit challenge is, so indeed, it's, take the 131, it's a really unfortunate size to implement, because even on your PC, you have these SSE extensions, they're nicely 128 bit, so what, so that's why people like these binary extension fields because then you can bit slice everything and that, that tends to be much nicer. Then you don't have this problem. Okay. One, 
unrelated but obvious question also. Have you looked at Xboxes at all? So, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Um, no, because as far as I know, uh, you're not allowed to install your own operating system on an Xbox. And we didn't want to break or hack open anything, so we, we never looked in detail in the, at the architecture for the Xbox or how to get these things running on the Xbox. Would you be willing to if you got permission? Yes, the, it would be a really fun project. Thank you.